Uh, today we'll be looking at troubleshooting email and missing messages. Um, this is the last of the webinars which cover troubleshooting email. The videos of the first webinar, Understanding the Mail Log, and the second webinar, Understanding Email Headers, are available for viewing in the Support Webinars section of our website. Today's presentation on troubleshooting missing messages will show you how to find and solve email delivery problems using the tools that we have covered in the first two seminars. It, uh, as an aside, it took me quite a while to actually put this together because troubleshooting email requires lots of different skill sets and trying to put it together in a way that makes sense and uh, to get us to the point where we are today, hopefully, uh, hopefully I've done a job that's good enough to it will help you to understand what's really going on. So let's start today's uh, presentation with a quick review of what email is and what it isn't. Most people don't think much about email. They, they, they just use it because it's convenient, mostly reliable, cheap, and quick. They don't normally realize that unless it's encrypted, Don't send anything in an email you wouldn't post on the bulletin board at the local supermarket. And additionally, oops, going the wrong way here. It's not trustworthy. Unless a message is digitally signed with a secure key, you can't be sure who really sent the message. You can see where it, it, it didn't come from, but you don't really know where it, if that's the sender or not, no matter what you do. And while mail is generally delivered in a few seconds, you, you can't be sure it will be immediately delivered or that it was ever read by the recipient unless I send you a specific reply. And today, over 95% of all the email on that track on the Internet is spam, malware or phishing scams. And the point I'm trying to make here is that email is often delivered and used to deliver information that should never be sent by email. Mission critical, time sensitive, con or confidential information can never be sent into normal, unencrypted email. So when I hear from a, uh, an irate uh, mail user that, that their missing message is absolutely essential to their business, I'm often tempted to say, then why don't you send by email? Troubleshooting email typically involves looking for lost or missing emails. The most common type of missing email is where the sender of the message receives a non-delivery receipt or an NDR. The NDR is an automated message informing the sender that an email they sent was not delivered. The next common case is where the sender of a message reports that a message they sent was not delivered, but they did not receive an NDR. It just went missing. And the last case we'll look at today is where the recipient reports that a message they expected to receive uh, was not delivered, but the sender never received an NDR. Let's start by looking at the most typical of these cases. The sender of a message receives a non-delivery receipt. Okay, I'm on the phone. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Sorry. Some of the staff just saying good night. The non-delivery receipt is commonly referred to as an NDR. It's also called a delivery status notification, or DSN, or simply the bounced message. It's sent to the return path address in the header of the bounced message by the MTA that could not deliver or relay the email. Now, there are many reasons why an email may bounce. It might have bounced because the recipient's address is misspelled or it simply does not exist on the receiving server. This is typically reported as a user unknown condition. Or it might have been rejected because the receiving server is out of resources, such as memory, disk space, CPU cycles. Or it could have been undeliverable because the receiving server is down or off the network or it might have been rejected because spam filters just rejected the message. The important thing to know and remember is that the NDR contains the information you need to solve the bounce problem. Bounce messages are, are normally sent with an envelope sender address that's from colon, um, left angle bracket, right angle bracket, which is commonly called the null sender address. Now, if you think about it, uh, it's from, you can't reply to that. So it implies it's an administrative message it shouldn't be replied to. That's why it's called a null sender. They're frequently sent from the uh, address of mail or demon at domain, where domain is the domain name of the site that sent the NDR. And uh, typically, 
a bounce message will contain several pieces of information to help the original sender understand the reason the message was not deliverable. Uh, typically, these include the date and time the message was bounced, the identity of the email server that bounced it, the reason it was bounced, and this is obviously solves your problem if you can figure that out, uh, the headers of the bounced message, some of the headers of the bounced message, and some are all of the content of the bounced message. Um, the format for the reporting of administrative message is defined by RFC 6522. Now, as they defined, these are, are not closely adhered to. The format of these NDRs can, can vary widely, but the, the, the parts pretty much remain the same. Uh, the first part is, is after the from, to, and subject, is a human readable explanation of the problem. Uh, the second part of the message, and the message also contains a parsable message delivery status. This part will typically contain a diagnostic code like uh, 422, the recipient has exceeded the mailbox limit, 5.1.1, user unknown. It's important to note that the diagnostic codes that start with a 4 are temporary failure errors that tell the sending MTA to try again later. When a 4XX code is received by the sender's MTA four hours after the first delivery attempt, the sender will then be notified by their own MTA that uh, the message has not been delivered after four hours and that the delivery attempts will continue for five days. Now you've all seen these. It shouldn't be a surprise. Diagnostic codes that start with a 5 like 5XX, 511, 517, are permanent failures that tell the sending MTA to immediately return the message to the sender with an NDR that tells the sender why the message was not deliverable. Now, diagnostic codes vary from MTA to MTA. While the webinar reference sheet contains a link to some of the commonly used diagnostic codes, it's, it's often quicker and more informative just to use Google NDR code to search for the NDR code, where it's NDR code, and the code itself. Uh, here's an example of an MDR. Uh, you see the from subject to and the time the original message was received from the local host. And the following portion in blue is the human readable part. The following address had permanent failure errors. The message you were sent to and the reason. The email account you tried to reach was not, not, does not exist. Please try. And you don't know what to try because it exceeded the mass, uh, maximum size, uh, size of the, the line it can handle. So, but you get the idea. The, the account didn't exist, so that's why the message was bounced. This is most of the machine parsable part. And it's a little more obtuse, but you'll see it, it tells you a lot of useful information. Who reported the delivery failure? The recipient. Uh, the remote MTA that wouldn't take the message. The diagnostic code, and again, that's the same thing we saw before. The first part just literally scoops us out of the second part and puts it in the, in the message. And the last attempt date was Wednesday, September 25th. And finally, here's a flow diagram for a typical email delivery. The green arrows show the normal delivery path, sender's mail tool, sender's MTA, uh, a relay, recipient's MDA, and the recipient's mail tool. Now, if everything goes well. But if any part of this chain can't deliver the message, in other words, say the, the sender's MTA can't send it to the relay, the sender's MTA will then send a message back to the sender, which he'll pick up with his mail tool, reporting they couldn't be delivered. So any point in this, in this process can fail, and the message will tell you which part failed when and why. Yeah. Again, the RFCA, uh, the RFC requires that when a temporary failure code is received by the sending MTA, delivery attempt should be continued for five days. Then if the message is still undeliverable after five days, it should be returned to the sender along with the delivery failure. Now, note that these time periods of four hours and five days are standards and they're defined by the RFC but they are sometimes modified by Google's email administrator. So you can't really depend on that 100%. Uh, but before we get to analyzing the actual troubleshooting process, let's review how to set up a couple of the tools that we're using to analyze email deliveries. The first trick is to set up an external email account for receiving test emails. 
we recommend Gmail as being one of the more correctly configured free or low low cost email account providers. Uh, do avoid using cable companies like Comcast or RCM and never use Yahoo, please. Next, you'll need to set up a completely unfiltered email address at your own domain. Uh, it's easy to do. Just uh, use the DMX Plus web interface to set up Access Map to add the key to Tester1 as your uh, test domain. Uh, Tester1, or some strange, slightly different name, is, uh, is a good idea because this is an unfiltered account. And for instance, we use support at fsl.com as our unfiltered account. And as a result of using support, we have to take and throw away manually a lot of junk every day. Um, the second trick is to make sure it comes all the way through. Set up an exception for scan messages so the tester one at domain.com dot no won't get scanned. There are more detailed instructions with screenshots included in the webinar reference section, so this shouldn't be hard to do. And we'll also, in our analysis, we'll also use the report functions that are built into the Barricade MX Plus web interface. If you're using Barricade MX, you can still use the Logs tab of the web interface to perform simple string searches of selected mail logs instead of the DMX reports. It's just a web-based report function. How to use Barricade, Barricade MX Plus reporting is fully documented in the support section of the FSL website. Let's take a minute, just a minute, to review the difference between the two types of Barricade MX reports that are available. The first report type is selected by using the web interface to navigate to Reports SMTP Log Search. This search page fronts a special database that contains limited information on all connections to port 25 that were, that were made during the last three days. Now that's whether it's accepted, whether it's dropped, whether it's uh, return to the sender. It's for convenience only and is not guaranteed to be complete. In fact, records will be overwritten if the same sender sends a later message to the same recipient from the same IP address. It's just mainly to quickly see if somebody ever connected. And it records the Haraka and uh, it doesn't record, it records all the Haraka connections, but only parts of them. The second report is selected by using the web interface to navigate to reports, run reports. This search page can be used to build and save complex queries against data in the MailLog Postgres database. The MailLog database contains extensive data for each message that Haraka accepted and passed off, excuse me, passed off the mail scanner for further processing and delivery to the recipient for the quarantine. And the last tool we'll discuss briefly uh, is FREP or GREP. Uh, GREP is the Global Regular Expression Parser. The GREP command usually searches a specified pattern to match uh, a string, uh, to match a specific string within a text file or a series of text files. FGREP, fixed or fast GREP, depending on where you look up the word, searches files for one or more pattern arguments. This command doesn't use the extended capabilities of regular extension. Instead, it just does a direct string comparison to find matching lines. As a result, it's much faster in searching than using graph. Now, the common use of syntax is fairly simple. Uh, the command, what to look for, and what file to file or files to search. And some simple examples here. Look for stevebitswing.com in barlog mailog return. Look for October 8th. Um, it's in single backticks because there's a space. And then type that result to look for Steve at Sweeney.com. So this will show me all the uh, lines that contain Steve at Sweeney.com that are, happen to occur on October 8th in the, uh, in the mail log. And then you can type it to a file. FGRAP notices Barlow mail log. And then look for abc.com and then redirect the output to a file, temp notices out. Or you can pass it to pipe after pipe after pipe. FGRAP, October 8th, Barlow mail log, send that to a rocket, and then that send that to more so it doesn't scroll off the screen too quickly. Now there are more FGRAP examples in the webinar reference sheet. Um, it's not a complicated command to use the way we need to use it just to look for text strings. So and finally we get to the fun part. What I've tried to to create is a diagram that will lead you through the steps you need to, 
to solve email delivery problems. We'll look at two of these diagrams because the steps are different if you're tracking mail from or mail to problem. So let's start with a mail from problem. Note that the ovals denote the start or end of a problem. Diamonds denote a decision point has to be made. And text boxes denote a process that needs to be run or a step that needs to be run. So a message, this is, I never got some of these messages, this is incoming mail, tracking an incoming message, is simple. Do you have an NDR? If you do, well, as you're saying, the NDR, if you get the complete NDR, I often get cut snippets, which only means I have to go back and get the complete NDR from the sender, have the, have the, the, the reason the message was dropped in it, so your problem solved. If you don't have an NDR, the simplest thing to do is try to get one. They are sent in most cases. Uh, you'll hear people say, never got one, never got one, never got one. Well, they did get one, they forgot it, or they're, uh, sometimes it's just too easy to look for it, but it's great if you got it, your problem's over. If you didn't, now, I've got a path, and I've got an alternate path, and here's what I recommend most people when they're starting out to go back and have, whoops, well, sorry, go back and have the sender of the original message with your admin preferably the sender of the original message. Send test messages to the original recipient, to your external mailbox, and to the unfiltered address. And the reason I say send test messages is if the test message doesn't show up, your well your problem's not over, but the problem not with your mail system. The problem's not leaving the the problem is not leaving the sender site. The problem message is not leaving the sender site. And there's no way to to troubleshoot this any further until you contact the sender. Now, uh, contacting the sender's postmaster is usually usually a waste of time. Uh, what I normally suggest doing is you or the your user contact the sender and ask them to tell their mail administrator that we can't see the message ever left their site and can they help us see help them see why not. Okay. The alternate, and this is what Steve and I do a lot of the time, uh, because we can We've done it so often we, we can spot some things right away. Uh, don't send the test message. Go right to the information you have and get the connecting IP address. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't finish the first part. Uh, well, if the test message is received, yeah, then you go to the test messages and get the connecting IP and host name. Um, then you can use that to run the reports, first the, the, the short report and then the full uh, uh, log search. And typically, if you learn or remember how to read the headers and the logs, the message and the reason will be in there. Um, and it will be in there in, in English. It's clear enough to read. Some can be a little obtuse. If you can't, if you see something you don't know what it is in a mail log or a mail message or a mail header, you'll get amazing results just by taking that string and Googling for the string. It will at least explain to you what that part of the law of the message means. It will be very useful. And uh, that's what you use in the last part. If you can't find anything in the run reports, then you've got to search the logs. And either you find the solution or you don't, in which case you probably have to contact the sender or contact us. Okay. Now, as you get better and better at this, you can sometimes skip the test messages. So what Steam or I would do, we'll go get from the information the user send us, or from our looking at the logs and grabbing through the logs, we'll try to find the connecting host and IP host name, and then we'll know the process. So what we'll do is we'll go here, and then we'll go right to here, search the logs, and we'll find the solution. But you need to do this a few times, quite a few times, to get a feeling for how the process flows and what you'd be looking for in the, in the, uh, in the logs, which is why I've set it up this way. This is the beginner's way, but it's really the best way to learn more and more about searching the logs. Now, the other case is, is a little different. This is somebody who never got my email. This is somebody from your site sent somebody an email they didn't get it. Well, did they get an NDR? If they did, or you can get it from them, problem solved, because it will tell you why their message was not delivered. But then you've got to start by searching the mail hub logs, because there's a chance that it never left the mail hub. For instance, if they typed in the wrong address, 
and the mail and your mail hub is sending mail directly to the internet. It's not going out through a smart host. Then that's the only place that's reported. So if you find the solution in the mail hub logs, you're done. If you don't find a solution in the mail hub logs and you're using a, a smart relay gateway for all of your outbound email, okay, then you can do the same thing you did on the outbound message. You can run reports, find the solution, no. Search the logs, find the solution, yes. If you don't, this is when you contact us. If you find the solution, you're home free. So once you get in the habit of of going through this process, sending the test messages, reading the headers. It doesn't take long to get pretty good at, at tracking and finding email problems. And if that happens to you, you'll be in a pretty select club. Because I'll tell you, from my experience, the most normal admins, uh, unless they're experienced email admins, can't do it. Which is why we, we do most of it. Now, I'm continually surprised by how little tech support we do which means that most of our messages are getting through, which pleases me no end. Um, and there's still some other problems. I mean, we haven't covered every case here. Quarantine messages can disappear without a trace. It depends how you configure your systems to, to notify senders, not notify senders, etc. But quarantine messages, if you follow the steps I've just outlined, will be found in the reports or the mail logs. For instance, when you run a, a long report on a message and go to that detail, message detail sheets in the Barricade MX Plus um, interface, you'll see the message was quarantined. It'll, it'll tell you right there, and it was never delivered. Um, other strange problems that uh, occur occasionally and are, are relatively difficult to, to track and find. The first one is the I.O. connection error. Uh, you don't get mail and you get a lot of I.O. connection error timed out in the logs from an IP address that can't send you mail. Can. It can connect, but it can't send. So try to ping the IP address. If the ping fails you, you may have a condition that's called uh, MTU path discovery and filtering INCP problems or MTU black holes or lots of things. Uh, some people cut off all ping packets on the router. That's bad because it, uh, there are conditions when type 3 packets are used to negotiate a packet size over the internet. In other words, depending on the route of messages taking, uh, mail starts out with small packets, the SMTP conversation. Then it goes to the data phase, it goes to very big packets. If some hop or relay in that process can't handle the bigger packets, it uses a, a, a type 3 packet, and this is explained in great detail in the reference, to negotiate a new packet size. If IMC packets are blocked, all IMC packets, including type 3, are blocked, uh, you can't negotiate a new packet size, and the TCP IP connection goes into a black hole. Okay? So, and most people don't know where to look for that. Read the uh, reference in the uh, reference page. It's interesting, and it will teach you never to block all uh, all IMC packets. You can block ping, but not everything. Firewalls are another cause of problems. Um, Cisco has a famous uh, SMTP fix-up um, protocol, which runs on a router and gets in between the connection between the sending and receiving MTAs. It's horrible. It can cause all kinds of hard to, hard to define problems. Uh, you can recognize it because as soon as you tell them that in one of these routers in front of an MTA, you'll see a long string of asterisks. Just tell them immediately to shut the, the protocol down. And sometimes, the, the element firewall was, sometimes we'll hit sites where the admins have put uh, port 25 rules on the firewall. Generally, it's not necessary, it's not a good idea because uh, email administrators typically are not router administrators, and they'll never be able to find the problem until they find the router administrator and get away with the router. It's rare, but it's happened to us a couple times in the last uh, two months, so. And it took several days to find the problem, right? And the last piece of the way is going to be really hard to find because they're stealthy. 
you don't even know they're there until you ask the client, oh, are you using an intrusion detection system? They can be correctly misconfigured to, to do just about anything, including silently drop packets. So if somebody thinks that nobody should make sense where the connections are packets than X, even on port 25, and they silently drop them, and your mail disappears, you will have the devil of a time finding that unless you know the question to ask and who to ask it from. So having said that, now I've gone fast today. I've covered a lot. So I hope there's some questions today. But we're in the question period already. So how hard can it be to troubleshoot emails? <laughs> okay. Um, Thanks, Steve.